it got real quiet, real quick, almost <laughs> like eerie. So today we're going to be in Psalm. Today we're going to be in Psalm 80, 82, uh, I believe it is. Yeah, Psalm 82. And while you guys are, I don't know, is this mic on even? Oh yeah. Oh, I thought it was just a loud mouth. Um, while we're while you guys are turning there, so I read through a another little spot this week, and I thought, you know, I'm going to read that Sunday morning. And it's in Luke, it's chapter 12. I marked the wrong spot. Yeah, in Luke chap- chapter 12, and it's verse 22 through 33. And I know I'm supposed to read the Psalms first, but I hope this slides. I figure if I'm reading out of God's word, it's God's word, right? Read. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it says, Then he said to his disciples, and it says in him is God. It's, it's all in red print. It says, Therefore I'd say to you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on it. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Ah, I went too far. I'm sorry. And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And if you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat, nor what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind for all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you need these things, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, but it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I'd read that this week, and I thought, you know, I mean, how many times do we doubt the fact that God has a plan for us? Or doubt the fact that we're doing God's plan? I mean, sometimes we're not step by step, but that's us as humans. We, we slip, we slide, we fall down. Sometimes we feel like we got a little nudge in the back of the head if we're getting astray and God shoves us in the mud. That's me anyways. But, um, you know, as long as we're trying to succeed and trying to do God's will, that's all that it's about. And he's the one that we need to do it for. Not nobody else, not nothing else, but do it for God. And if we worry that we're not doing it or that we don't even care, there's another little spot, just a, a few more verses, that God even knows the numbers of hairs on our head. And how awesome is that, that each one of us sitting here, each one of us in the world, God knows the numbers of our head, or the numbers of hairs on our head even, something that little or big, it depends on how you want to look at it. And we worry about where we're getting our next meal or what our next paycheck's going to bring and how many bills we could pay or who knows what. You listed it probably on there for some people. But anyways, I just felt like I needed to share that. So Psalm 81, if ever, or 82, if everyone could please stand up. It's a shorter one than that, Luke. It says, do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. Nope, wrong one. Thank you. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. Thanks, guys. <laughs> 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as I just read in Luke, Lord, it don't matter who we are or what we've done, Father. You know each one of our deepest desires, Lord. I mean, you you take care of the smallest of bugs or the smallest of birds or insects. Lord, why wouldn't you take care of us if we ask? 
Lord, so that's what I do ask right now is embrace each one of us, Father. Take away all of our cares, all of our worries, Father, and help us with all of our struggles, Lord. Lord, and just be there. Embrace us. Thank you for everything that you do, Father. In your name, amen. 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 What the Lord just laid through John about being reminded of all these things, these first two songs, are they're really not praise songs, but they're reminder songs to let us to be reminded that we're on our way home. This is not our home game. So let's just uh, give it to the Lord this morning. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, would you know? I have no friend like you. If heaven is not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. I have some family just over in glory land. And I don't expect to stop until I shake their hands. They're waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just go in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. There's on the sweetest praise, drift back to heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. First verse. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And I can feel at home in this world anymore. And I can feel at home in this world got a hold of my life and he won't let go Jesus got into my heart he got into my soul I used to be oh so sad but now I'm just free and glad cause Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let go Sometimes I remember how I used to live in sin. I tried to act happy and free, but I wasn't with it. I fooled a lot of friends of mine. They thought I had some peace of mind. But I never had a thing until I opened up and let Jesus in. Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let go. Jesus got into my heart, he got into my soul. I used to be oh so sad, but now I'm just free and glad. Cause 
Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let go Aren't you getting just a bit tired of fooling around You try to laugh right through life but you're not gaining ground Why not try the Lord today Just ask him in your heart to stay and you'll find Jesus' love to be the greatest thing you ever found, yeah. Jesus got a hold of my life, and he won't let go. Jesus got into my heart, he got into my soul. I used to be oh so sad, but now I'm just free and glad. Cause Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let go. Cause Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let go. Amen. So we all reminded of that? Amen. All right. Lord, thank you so much. And as we continue just to sing to you now, Lord, uh, thank you for the reminders through the Psalms and the scriptures and how you care for us. And Lord, you got a hold of us, and the great part about it is you're not letting go. And we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, gang, let's worship our Lord. Stand or sit, however you desire. Jesus got a hold of my life, and he won't let go. Savior, you bore all my shame, all because of your love, all because of your love. Maker of the universe, broken for the sins of the earth, all because of your love, all because of your love. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love I live. Innocent and holy. You died to set the captive free All because of your love All because of your love Lord, you gave your life for me and I will live my life for you All because of your love All because of your love Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love I live. You did it for me. You did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give Because of your love, because of your love I live Because of your love, because of your love I live
last song here. I don't know how to start it out. Anybody here ever feel like they screwed up in life? <laughs> how many feel we got cracks in our vases? Every time we fill it up with water, it leaks, right? Just leaks right out. This story is for you, and it's for me. It's about a fictional story, but pretend it's a person. There was two vases one was cracked, broken. The other vase was perfect, painted, everything was beautiful on it, things like that. They'd fill up the one vase, and they'd, the uh, owner would hurry up and take the vase full of water, and he'd try to bring it all the way down to the end to where they were going to water the flowers. They were going to make use of something. Where the other vase, it was always prim and proper, never leaked, and the, and the owner could take and drop off here and drop off there. and dry. Everything was really, really perfect. At the end of the vase's life, not that vases have life, humor me. At the end of the vase's life, the vase came to the place to the owner and he says, I feel I was worthless. I leaked all my life. Every time I tried to get close, every time I tried to carry water, I just leaked out. Amen? Amen. That's us. And the owner took that vase off to the side and he took him for a walk down that sidewalk. He says, you see all those flowers on that sidewalk? That same path that you walked. He said, all that time you were leaking, you were watering flowers. And those flowers are a whole lot bigger than that side over there. Of the perfect one. So gang, what we do, we leak. What do we leak? We leak the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what we're here for. We're to leak. We're to get it out of us. The Lord wants to fill us. So if you're here and you know that, and you ever run across somebody that leaks in life, let them know that's a good thing. Don't contain it. Just get it out and let the Lord leak you through right here. So let's just sing an old, simple song of love to our Lord. I sing a simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior. My heart is glad that you call me your home, and there's no place I'd rather be than in your arms. Why don't we 
all stand, okay? Let's just stand before our Lord and sing a simple song to Him. The Lord leads you to raise your hands up to Him. We're just worshiping. I sing the simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior, oh, precious Jesus. My heart is glad that you call me your home, and there's no place I'd rather be. And in your arms of love, in your arms of love, holding me still. asking that you would be our holder, that you would be the one that we could go to. And we still do, Lord. We come to you and we're asking, Lord, that you're always holding on to us. But Lord, right now we got people on our hearts and on our minds that need you. Who's that person on your heart right now? That's who we're praying for. They need a hold of the Lord. They're struggling in life or something's going on and maybe they don't even know it. So Lord, we lift up these people right now, this person they're wandering through life right now and they're just asking for help but the Lord they might even be asking in the wrong places we're asking for them we're asking Lord that you'd come and touch them they might even be sick right now they might be in a broken relationship a job loss they're lost they're wandering around like a bunch of lost puppies Lord would you come upon them Call them your own, Lord. Give them the grace to call on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They can't do it without you. Just like people were praying for us, Lord, we pray for them. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's sing that same verse one more time. Amen. Sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. lost now we pray for these people Lord that are on our hearts and we're praying Lord that they'd be able to sing amazing grace in their own heart to where they would be able to say I once was lost but now I'm found I was once a wretch but now I'm free thank you, Lord thank you remind us to bring these people home with us today we give you all the glory and praise Lord to think that we could stand before you and sing and you accept it through Jesus Christ we pray we never take that for granted. Thank you for the freedom we have. In Jesus' name, together we say, amen. amen. All right. Believe it or not, if you're born again, you're going to spend each other with heaven, so you better get to know them now. All right? Start shaking hands. Love you, brother. It's the other way around, buddy.
if you knew what was going on up here. I, Morning, everybody. Good morning to you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. I'll wait. <laughs> okay, one of the ladies and uh, for the Women's Fellowship, it's next Saturday here at 9 in the morning, and uh, she made me a nice little greeting card in crayon. She wanted us to be reminded of this. So you guys got this all set next Saturday, 9 o'clock, here at the church, all right? Also, in the bulletin, I hope you uh, got one of these here, these little cards. They're called the ABCs of Salvation. This was a gift to the church, and so we threw them in the bulletins there. And uh, put them in your Bibles, carry them, make copies of them. But really... It, it's for us, but it's really to go out and tell others about this. 
And it's really, I don't want to say it's easy to lead people to Christ because it always involves the Holy Spirit. It can't be done without the Holy Spirit. But sometimes the Holy Spirit springs it on us and he wants us to tell people about Christ. So if you got this card, believe me, don't worry about, you know, how you present it. You just basically read God's word, go to the ABCs, and let God do the wrestling with them. That's the greatest thing about this. I don't, I, I, the presentation is not up to me. The presentation is up to the Holy Spirit. We're just the mouthpieces. So use God's word. Keep it. Make copies of them. Keep them in your car if you need to. But uh, anyways, they're in the bulletin. Do you know anybody that needs Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Amen. Look at that. Now think about that. God wants to populate heaven. And for some reason, he's called us to do that, to be part of it, to be an instrument. So as the Lord leads you to do this, okay? And then also, just a reminder, prayer has been moved back here uh, Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. So we'll be back here for prayer tonight also. All right. I'm just going to throw this out here today. Anybody have any praises they want to make known today to the crowd, to the church, to the body? Anybody have anything they want to share? Jeanette. She's at Myers and real happy. Right on, man. Praise the Lord. Yes. Yes. When she said it last week, she said she is not going back to the other place. She likes Myers. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Right on. Anybody else? Jeff. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and it's raining out there and we're dry. Simple things we take for granted out there. Everybody's car start this morning? All right. Everybody got gas in their car? Well, a couple kids don't. Ben doesn't have gas. <laughs> We're going to pray for you. Your car didn't start? Oh, Ben. <laughs> All right, let's pray for Ben. All right, let's go for it. He's here, but he's here. You're right. Oh, goodness. All right, I won't push the buttons. Let's pray. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Glad to see you're here, Patricia, in that back row gang. By the way, I got a joke about this. There's been an addition to the back row gang, and they've really been riding Dale hard. So stay with Dale, okay? <laughs> he can't get no peace back there. They, they tell him what they, I love it. This is good stuff. So hang in there, Dale. One day you'll be moved by the thermometer, and Sandra will give you her spot. So <laughs> they, Thank you, Lord, so much for the joy in our hearts and the spirit you give us. And thank you for cars that start and cars that don't. You've got a reason for it. Thank you for gas and our cars and food and our refrigerators. Thank you for jobs you give us. And thank you, Lord, more than anything for Jesus Christ. Why he puts up with us, we have no idea. This love that we need to have a bigger grip on in our own lives, that's our prayer, that we would learn to love like Jesus loves Lord, give us that opportunity to do that. Lord, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they, they, they're not sure of heaven, that today, by the end of the day, they will. They will. They will know that their, their salvation has been secured through the blood of Christ. So, Lord, thank you for this day. And then now as we go through your word and we get to have time together with you personally, we ask that as a church and individually, you would do the talking. You would do the speaking to us in Jesus' name. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, gang, at Acts chapter 17, verse 18. So if you want to turn your Bibles there. Just because you go through a chapter, it doesn't mean the scene or the city is the same. It means that they could have traveled, they could have went someplace, such is the case in Acts chapter uh, 17 here, I'm sorry, uh, 18 right here. But as we were, as we're looking at, whoops, I'm sorry, do I got, yeah, chapter 18. Yep, and we're going to pick up on chapter 18. Now what's going on here, Paul is wandering through town. 
He's waiting for his two buddies, Timothy and Silas, to meet up with him as he left him in another town, and he sent word that he wants him back over here right now. While he's going through town, he notices a bunch of altars, a bunch of idols, and he realizes that this town is given over to idolatry, Greek mythology. In fact, it probably is even bleeding into occultism. And he's looking at all of these things. Knowing Paul's bent, he doesn't want to leave it right there. He wants to get the truth of Jesus Christ out. The way he does it, I love it. It's just a great example for us today. So we're going to talk about at least two different things, the way we present the gospel. But it's also going to see, do we have paganism, occultism, or mythology in our lives? Right away, we'd say no. Well, let's let God's Word begin to speak to us right now. So I'm going to read um, on this chapter, Acts 18, and I'm going to start with verse 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. You know what? Do I got the right spot? I don't. Chapter 17, verse 16. Yep, chapter 17, verse 18. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily, excuse me, daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Now, another word for babbler it was a derogatory. It wasn't just somebody who babbled. They called him a seed picker. A seed picker is somebody that basically went and scrounged and picked up scraps. They're, they're associating him with the very... And poor people were not looked upon very highly, especially in Athens in that area right there. So he said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying... May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, we'll be finishing that here in a minute. Idolatry, paganism, occultism, mythology. Some may say, I'm in mythology, but I don't worship Satan. Some would say, I'm a pagan, but I don't worship Satan. Satan doesn't care what you do as long as it doesn't seek Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter to him. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So first of all, what is paganism? I'm going to read from the Merriman Webster Dictionary. Please uh, bear with me. Pagan is derived from the Latin, the late Latin, paganus, which was used at the end of the Roman Empire to name those who practice a religion other than Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. Now, it doesn't mean Judaism or Islam is the true faith. It just means those, that's where those who were called pagans, if they didn't, weren't, weren't involved for the, um, excuse me, with those three uh, religions. Early Christians often used the term to refer to non-Christians who worshiped multiple deities. The definition and etymology of heathen overlap with those of pagan. Both words denote an unconverted member of a people or nation that does not acknowledge the God of the Bible. Now, paganism. It doesn't take much to realize that paganism has basically infiltrated our society. It's always been there. What I have noticed, as long as I've been paying attention to this stuff, it's not only in society, Believe it or not, it's gotten into the church. I'm going to give you a few practices here right now of what it's gotten into. All right, first of all, I bet you didn't know this. The days of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Did you know that these were named after pagan gods? I'm going to read this to you right here. Monday comes from the Anglo-Saxon word monadaic, which is translates to moon's day, celebrating. It's not that they're just naming it after the moon. Remember, this is paganism, mythology. It's named after the moon to celebrate the moon. It comes from the French lundi or Spanish loons relating to luna. Remember lunar? The 
lunar eclipse, things like that, okay? That's our Monday right there. Tuesday comes from, it's, it's a, comes from a German god, Germanic, Tiu, the god of war. This was honored, the god, the god of war, not a person, the god of war. Wednesday comes from the, the Norse gods, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, comes from the Norse gods. Wednesday worships the god of Odin. That's where we get the word Woden's Day, we call today Wednesday. Did you know that? Woden's Day. All right? Thursday comes from the god Thor. You got it. Thor. I am Thor. You know, this the mythological god up there, right there. And then Friday, or Freya, is clearly Friday. And, and again, it all comes from the, uh, the Norse gods right there. Now... You won't find Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in the Bible. What you will find, and they came together on the first day of the week, on the second day of the week, on the third day of the week. Now, Christians tried to rename the days after their saints, is what they tried to do, but the pagan gods, the, the name stuck right there, and that's why we do it today. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to change the names of the days. Not going to happen. But I just want to let you know that there are things in our lives that are infiltrated with paganism that we need to pay special attention to right here. And the list is long. Now, I'm going to deal with the next one because that's the season we're in right now. And uh, this one has to do with Halloween. Now, here's where I usually make friends or make enemies. We can still eat together after church, okay? We're still going to be friends, all right? Don't hate me. I'm not going to hate you. I've either stepped on toes for 35 years over this or I've gotten pats on the back. I, I don't know. I know what the Lord showed me in his word. And so I'm just going to share that with you because we're dealing with pagan gods in Acts 17. And we're actually in this time of year right now. Now, Halloween comes from the Celtic pagan roots. The original holiday was called Samhain, marking the end of summer and the beginning of winter. Samhain was a day that celebrates spirits and the dead as year and vegetation begin to die. This season was to allow spirits to cross into the physical realm. So pagans would have bonfires to communicate with these spirits through ashes or roasting nuts. Dressing up in a costume was meant to resemble the evil spirits, get this, so they would think that you were one of them and not bother you. Christians adopted this holiday and renamed it All Hallows' Eve to remember their deceased saints and martyrs. Still dealing with the dead on that one right there, okay? Now, again, this is where I got, I'm just going to share with what, I, what I've learned over the years. And what we talked about last week was critical thinking. I am not asking you to take my word for this. I am asking you to start digging. You do your own research. I had to do it because I had people tell me I was a new Christian. I was, people were saying this is wrong. There's nothing to worry about. And all of a sudden, during that course of time, I began, as I was reading my Bible, I began to realize that something, at least the way I was seeing it, was not right. So I did my research in biblical, you know, talks of what it talked about, witches and magic and warlocks. Gang, all that stuff is real, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. That's not mytholo mythological. All that stuff is real. Witchcraft, warlocks, magic arts, that's all real because it deals with the demonic right there. But I'm going to tell you, that in itself seemed to be enough for me, but I wanted to know more. I wanted to know what the dark side said about it. So if the dark side said, oh, it's nothing, now, they could be lying, but usually, in this case, they didn't lie. So I'm going to, I'm, we're going to use some slides today and I want to show you what the dark side says about Halloween. Now, there's, there's different uh, feast days that they follow also. But I'm going to show you, and, and this blew my mind. So I, I found them. I dug them up here, and we're going to look at them today. So please bear with me as we uh, read on the slides. If you want to click those slides on right there. Hopefully I put it in big enough font. The picture you see on there is not Satan picture on there is the name, his name is Anton LaVey. He's the founder of the Church of Satan. He has since died. We're going to talk a little bit about him. Here's what he said. I'm glad that, a Christian, that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. He said that. That's his, his story. People who think that Halloween is just some 
make-believe thing, and we're out there doing it. I'm not going to, for the sake of, of the story and for the sake of the content, I'm not even going to tell you what they do on Halloween night. We're not even going to talk about it. Okay, the next one. The two main satanic holidays are Walpurgis Nacht and Halloween. I'm glad that Christian parents, again, he says this, let their children worship the devil at least one night of the year. Again, quoting, we see this holiday as a night when the mundane folk try to reach down inside and touch the darkness, for which Satanists is a daily mode of existence. In other words, we do that every day. Particularly in the United States, Halloween is a time for celebrating monster films wearing costumes of macrobe nature and evoking the thrill of fun fear. Children of all ages can indulge in their fantasies by donning costumes that allow for intense role-playing and the release of their demonic cores. These are his words. The parts of their personalities often hidden from their friends, co-workers, and families. This is listed on the, uh, on the site of the Church of Satan, what I just read. The Satanic Bible ranks Halloween as one of the two most important festivals on the Satanic holiday. That's documented stuff. This isn't just words that we talk about and say, my friend's uncle, cousin said that. This is stuff you can actually find on the Internet right there. Okay, you want to change the next one? I can't read that top line right there. Halloween loves evil, death, and why we hate. And that's why we hate it. Thank you. Evil gods of death are being worshipped around the world at the same time Americans are celebrating Halloween. And the Celtic, the Mexican, and the South American, and the Hindu, Egypt, all Halloween. So as, as we send our kids out, that's what's going on around the world. They're not dealing with costumes. They are literally worshiping pagan, occultic, mythology, everything like that. They're going right out to that right there. Okay, next one, please. Now, what's my part as a Christian? This is what got me. You do your homework. Let God's word speak to you. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion or fellowship has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with a non-believer? Now, with Christ with Belial, Belial is Satan. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay? Now, we're looking at this cross. Obviously, it was the darkest day of all history. But three days later, what happened? That's right. He rose again. Next one. Again, he says, I'm glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. Next one. Okay, I, I think we read that one. Go one more. I'm sorry, I put that up there twice. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, and what, from what we just read from 2 Corinthians, and what communion has light? We believe that Jesus Christ is light. Next one. What communion has light with darkness? And again, I'm glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. Again, that's what changed me. When I began to realize what really went on that night. Believe me, I was the same guy. I dressed up my kids. I couldn't wait for the night. As I got older, the bars had Halloween parties, and we dressed up, and we did all that stuff. So I'm going to ask you, again, Paul went through that city... And he saw the gods. And he confronted it. And so today, we confront it. Now, the issue is, it may not be Halloween in our lives, but there's something. Paganism has infiltrated our lives. And our desire, God's desire is, and we'll talk about this, is that one by one, we begin to ask the Lord, how do I word this? It's not going to save you. If you've got Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, you're already there. But it's as you're growing with your wife and your husband, you begin to find out things that might bother them. You stop, well, you should stop doing it. <laughs> we don't always stop doing it, but we should stop doing it. So again, it's not my purpose to step on toes, but because we're here, 
this is the season. It seems every Halloween I have to deal with this. And believe me, I'm a minority. And if you believe it, you're a minority. I promise you, you're a minority. This has got to be between you and the Lord. Okay, you can shut that off now if you would, please. Thank you. Now, there are those that said that Anton LaVey was basically just, uh, he was in it for the show. He didn't really believe what he said out there, and it was basically just something for shock value. How many of us remember Charles Manson of 1970s? Anybody ever hear that name? Now it's a euphemism. You know, what did you do, turn Manson on us? Believe me, you don't want to go that way with that. Charles Manson right there was the leader of a cult, and he convinced his followers to, to murder several times. I remember, that. I remember waking up and reading about that in the papers and, and also listening to it on the radio right there. Susan Atkins was one of Charles Manson's followers. Here's what she said about Anton LaVey just being a pretend. I, love, I don't love this, but watch what comes out. Anton told me, quoting now Susan Atkins, Anton told me that as a Satanist, he does believe in the God of the Bible, but he refused to worship him and made a conscious decision to worship Satan instead. People think that Satanists or idolaters or pagans or mythology followers don't believe in God. That's not the case. They're making a choice. We made a choice to do that. Now, this is very interesting, and then I'm going to move on. Anton LaVey, in the end, talking about the end of his life, Anton LaVey, in the end, revealed that most of what he claimed in his life was not true. Anton LaVey's last words and deathbed confession quotes are something like, quoting now, I was wrong with what I did in this life. He founded the church of the devil and was a big part of preaching to live in the dark side of life. But in the end, few moments before he died, he told in front of the camera that he was fooled by the devil all his life. And now he's going to hell. Think about those words. I was fooled by the devil all my life, and now I'm going to hell. Isn't that the most sobering thing you've ever heard in your life? What do you think, gang? Eh? Huh? So, paganism, occultism, Halloween. I mean, we're, like I say, we're not going to change the days of the week, but there are some things that I can't. There are things that God will give me the strength to take hold of right there. And again, I, you might think I'm over-exaggerating. Listen, I'm not asking you. I promise you, I'm not asking you to take my word. I am asking you, as a pastor, you dig. You dig. You pray. Become a critical thinker like we talked about last week right there. You know, a little poison. with this little Halloween. Let me, I, I put a jar of water up here, and I fill it with water. And I got a little bit of rat poison. It's clear. And I mix it in there, stir it around, and I ask, how many are thirsty? Well, I, I would ask that before I did that. How many are thirsty? So I do that, and I put a little rat poison, and I stir it around. It's clear. Who wants a drink of water? All of a sudden, our thirst isn't, we wouldn't drink it, would we? I'd say, it's just a little rat poison. It's no big deal. It might, but you'll, your thirst will be quenched. Nobody would drink it. That's the point. The point is the world is offering us water when Jesus said, I am the living water. Come to me and drink and I will quench all your thirst. We don't have to participate in anything that is of the world. Thing. Jesus Christ gives us everything that we need and we dive into that right there, okay? Enough said. Now let's finish this chapter right here, okay? Paul goes up there and he sees that the paganism, the idolatry, maybe even bleeding into occultism is rampant. But watch how he handles this. I just love how he handles it. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Isn't that a great line? That's so friendly. I perceive you're all religious. You know what he didn't do? What I did. When I first found out about this, I, I shot people off at the knees. You Satan worshiper? <laughs> you pagan? I didn't gain a lot of friends. Didn't gain a lot of converts either in Christ's name. But what did Paul say? I see you're very religious. 
And he got their attention thinking, Paul is not the enemy here. It says, for, I was, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he gives Paul wisdom and knowledge, that gift, those two gifts. And he gives him the courage, the gift of courage. And he says, capitalize on that God. They're, they're unsure. Even though they're worshiping all these things, they're unsure to the unknown God. It's as if they're covering a base that they might have missed. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now remember, he's looking at all the temples, the little shrines, some big, some small. He doesn't dwell in them. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So he says, it isn't your little idols that God is that, you know, if I got to make a God and I worship that God and I'm stronger than that God, I'm in deep trouble. We're in deep, deep trouble. If I can create my God and my own ideas about who God is, and if I can create them, I'm in deep, deep trouble. It says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Let's stop there. The Lord planned for you to live where you're here. Now, have we ever bucked the system? Have we, yeah, have we ever done things? But where you were born was ordained by God. Where you live is ordained by God. The gifts you have was ordained by God, being a follower of Christ, if you are there. But he says, he put the boundaries in our dwellings. He placed you in these areas right here. But I like this. So that they would, I'm sorry, so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grow for him. God knew exactly he was going to orchestrate different things and put you in, you, you're not going to get away from it in hope that you might grope for God. He put all of these people in your lives and all these circumstances, even trials. Did you know that? Even trials. We talked about our leaky vases earlier. Do you know that our leaky vases God uses? He uses all these things right here. Why? So that, and he says, in the hope that we might grow for God. Is anybody here? We're hungry for something today, James. You're either hungry for more of God in your life or you might be hungry for God in your life. If you're hungry for, you're looking for answers in this life and you're trying to find the answer here or the answer there or in this relationship here or in that relationship there or in this toy or in that, you know what you're doing and, and you're trying to get it and you're trying to fill a hole in your heart. God is just saying, I'm, you're looking for me. You're looking for me. And once you find me, Everything else, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's what he says. And so all these years that I, that you, that we, we're out there looking for love in all the wrong places. We're looking for this relationship and that toy and this thing. God is saying, I'm the one you need. It's me. And here are these poor Athenians in Greece got all these gods and all these pagans and all this mythology and all of these desires, and they're all trying to find. You're going to see this here in a minute, just how hard up they were and how hungry they were. And Paul came to that. The unknown God, God says capitalize on that. He's the God who created the heavens and the earth because none of these gods could claim that. No other God claimed to be a creator of the heavens and the earth right there. It says, for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. God was even putting a witness into those that didn't even know him, and they were saying, we're, he's up there someplace, we are his offspring, we're his creation. They had it in them. Did you know that even the hardest core atheist has to fight? Either God's word is wrong or God's word is right. And it says in Romans that they had to purge God out of their minds. They had to get it out of them because the Bible says that all of creation points to one person, and that's God. All of it points to God. we got to literally fight God's desires for us to come to Him. For we are also His offspring. 
I'm sorry. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or like the idols you're looking at or something, something shaped by art in man's devising. What's man's devising? What it is man's devising is man's ideas on how to worship God. How, you might be asking yourself, how do I really worship you, Lord? I got it. This is what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to sell everything, and I'm going to start going to church every Sunday, and I'm going to start, God, and then maybe God will like me. Maybe God will be pleased with me. That's man's devising. That's man's ideas. How do I worship God? Do you know that from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible tells me how to worship God? And the more I read it, the deeper I understand about worshiping God. You know that sometimes worshiping God for me personally is the Lord. He's very good about this and he's very polite. I try to blab. I try to talk. I found that one of the best ways to worship God as the Lord leads is he just says, Tony, will you just be quiet? Will you just be quiet? I want to talk. I want, I want you to be silent. I want you to sit in silence for a minute and just listen to me talk. And sometimes I don't hear nothing for maybe a minute or two or later or three. But all of a sudden, the next thing you know, God begins to reveal himself to us. And we begin to realize, God, you're so good. You're so powerful. It says, truly, now again, not man's devisings, not our ideas. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So maybe we came in here today. I don't know what God's talking to you about. I got my own stuff. But when he begins to reveal stuff, he says, I overlooked your ignorance or unknowingness. Ignorance really isn't a bad word. It just means unknowing. He says, I've overlooked your ignorance in times past, but now that I'm waking you, now that I'm throwing this at you, I'm asking you to repent. I'm asking you to dig. I'm asking you to go and find out what's going on back there. And he says, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man. God will judge by the man, Christ Jesus, whom he has ordained. He has given us assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And this is the crux of the gospel. Gang, this is the only reason I follow Christianity. Now, Christianity in and of itself, on the basis of it, love everybody, treat others as you would have to treat it. You know, you got all these sayings, things like that. It's good stuff. But listen, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I could read the Quran. I could go into Hinduism. I could go into all these things, and I could find all the good stuff. But you know why I follow Christianity? It's because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Nobody else did that. If he would still be in that grave... Maybe I would try to follow it just because it was a good teacher, and many do. But if that was the case, if I'm... Listen, there's a lot of people who out there who say they're bad, but nobody raised themselves from the dead. That's bad in a good way. You got that? That's bad. That's really tough. Somebody raised themselves from the dead, I'm following them. Because guess what? I'm going to die. And if he can do it for him, he's going to do it for me if I follow him. Right? That's what this is all about. So he's got a crowd. He's got their attention. Sadly, just like it's always been, it says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again in this manner. Some mocked. I think about, what do you mean you mocked? You mocked over the resurrection, but you're, you're worshiping this God that supposedly fell down from Mars to Earth, and now you're worshiping this God that has no idea of creating a miracle. And, and you've got to take it and you've got to rub his belly and make a wish. <laughs> I have found this out and I've heard it said many times. It's amazing what people believe in once they reject the truth. When a person rejects truth, it's all wide right open. Everything happens. So some said, this is crazy. Some said, you know what, we'll hear you again later. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them, and, and believed among them Dionysius and the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with him. It's the same thing. 
Paul go in there, he'd rattle their cage, he'd, he'd say what he had to say, being led by the Lord. Some believed, some didn't. Some tried to kill him, some just said, get out of town. It's the same thing everywhere Paul went, but he couldn't let lives go. He had to step on it. So gang, what I want to close with here is this right now. Paul talked about the dead, but he also talked about the dead person he was talking about was raised from the dead. That's what we're to talk about all year long. The days of these last days, it's not even wrong to call yourself a pagan anymore. In fact, it's become popular. It's not even hard to call yourself, I follow a cult anymore. It's, it's popular. I worship the devil. I don't believe in God anymore. That's popular. Astrology used to be the big thing. You know, astrology is following stars instead of following Christ. Satan doesn't care who you follow. He just doesn't want you to follow Jesus Christ. You might say, well, can I do Jesus and this? If you're married, and I said this before, if you're married to one person, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are betrothed to him. You're betrothed to him. So if you're married right now, and if you're married to somebody, if you're married to somebody right now, and your husband or your wife says, I love you, I'll cook for you, I'll be with you, I'll sleep with you, I'll do all these things, but I'd like to have a boyfriend. I'd like to have a girlfriend. How would that fly? Doesn't that just, ugh, oh, that's too hard. That just hits you in the gut, doesn't it? That's what it does. And so when I tell Jesus, after you do your research, that anything God points out to you, I love you, but there's no such thing in the Bible to where it says, I love you, God, but it's not in there. Search it out. If you find it, let me know. Be a critical thinker. Go out there. All right. We read it before. I'm just going to read it again. 2 Corinthians, the same Paul wrote to another group of people. He said, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. In other words, he's saying, God is calling you to leave everything for me. I'm not restricting you, Paul said. Your own restrictions, your own biases are stopping you. Now in return for the same, I speak to his children, you also be open. And again, we read this part. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Now, it doesn't mean I separate myself from the world. Paul calls that also. But to have the closest of knit fellowship of worship Paul said, you can't do it. it does, you, there's two different gods involved. And what communion has light with darkness? I'll tell you what communion there is. You might be in the dark, but turn on your flashlight. What does one little light do to the darkness? But can darkness put out light? You can't. you got to shut the light off. And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what fellowship has Jesus with Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And again, this is why we talk about with young couples, if they're going to get married, the first couple, that, they say, hey, and you know, here, we, we try to keep our marriages here. They want to get married. I've got to make sure you both know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not just go to church, but you both got to know Jesus Christ. Talks about believer with unbeliever. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. Remember, Jesus Christ lives in you. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, I will close with this statement. I know it's getting dark out there, very dark. It's getting harder and harder to stand for Jesus Christ. Here's what I've learned in the past. When it comes to things, and it's not just Halloween, it's everything. It's witchcraft, it's good witch, white witch, black witch, all these things like that. And I'm a Christian, but I do this and I'm a Christian. What I have found, and I've heard this statement, and then it nailed it for me. We spend more time, and I'll use the word Halloween because that's what we talked about. As Christians, we spend more time defending Halloween than we do Jesus Christ on the cross. I, and it nailed it for me. You're exactly right. I'm trying to justify my actions instead of showing people the cross of Jesus Christ. All right, you take it home with you. You do whatever God says to do. You do your research. I'm not peeking in your window. 
the Holy Spirit is, <laughs> but I'm not. We're going to have coffee here in a minute, and I hope we still have coffee, and I hope we still have all this stuff together like that. We're going to come upon portions of Scripture that are very hard, and some of them are very easy. But I'm asking you, like the Bereans last week that we read, you do your own critical thinking and see if these things are so. Amen? Not very loud. Amen? All right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I didn't lose you there. Let's pray. Now, some of us here may not have ever accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior. And, and you're here today. We just read that God puts us in, a, in places and appointed times and he points things to us and he surrounds us with opportunities. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ, this isn't by chance. You may have been invited and, and God ordained that also. But you are here and maybe you need to have your sins forgiven and you want to know that if you were to die right now, that you would go to heaven. You want to know. And God is saying, I'm right here. And he's saying, just call on my son. Jesus said, it's, in fact, in Romans, he says that if we believe in our heart, if we believe in our heart that, that God is real and that God raised Jesus from the dead, and if we confess it with our mouth, I'm paraphrasing, but we confess it in our mouth and we believe these things, he says that we'll be saved. And we call Jesus the Lord of our life now. So maybe you're here right now, and Jesus Christ, he's a good guy, and, and you like him, and you read about him, and you kind of like to be like him. Well, Jesus said, I'm God, but I want you with me. And he wants to forgive you. He really, 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 really wants to forgive you. But you've got to ask. We're going to pray with you. Simple as this. Lord Jesus, I hear you. I am a sinner. I'm asking you to forgive me. I believe you went to the cross. I believe you died. And I believe you rose again. I believe it's your shed blood and only your shed blood that will wash away my sin. So I accept your provision right now. And I accept you right now to be the Lord, to be the Savior of my life. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit's power and Him personally so that I can now live for you. Now keep your heads down because this is an honest prayer. Because you know me, Lord. I am very weak. And I need your strength. In Jesus' name, together we say, amen. Let's sing an oldie here before we split up. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 6. Anybody that came across the Lord appearing to them in the Bible, they all said the same thing. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty.
is three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. That's a teaching out there, gang. But God is three separate persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, they're all after you. They love you so much. Isn't that the most wonderful thing in the whole world? Amen. And they're all chasing you down, man. And so I pray that if you're out running them, I pray he just sticks his foot out in the aisle of your life and he trips you. And the only thing you could do at that point is look up. And they're all there. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you so much for your word, your time that you've given us here, the, the special grace of mercy. We live now for you by your grace. And it's only because of your grace and your son and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, whatever you told us today, we, we're going to go and we're going to check it out and we're going to ask you to show us your way. Father, whatever it is that you tell us to do, give us the strength to do it. We can't do anything without your strength, Lord. We can't understand. We can't act unless you show us. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, together we say, Amen. Amen. Love you guys, gang. See you next time. I have time. been instructed to announce something this morning, and that is to invite each and every one of you to Pastor Appreciation Luncheon, right? following uh, the service. But there are a couple instructions. Um, first of all, is to, is to come. That's number one. Uh, you're invited to come. There's a lot of good food back there. And secondly, it's that uh, pastor and his wife, uh, but when I mentioned this to him, he said, remember the uh, verse? That the first shall be last. So I gotta be careful how I announce this. So Pastor Tony and Bonnie are last. No. I thought I had them. <laughs> so anyway. Um, <laughs> no, we are so grateful as a church that uh, our shepherd, Pastor Tony, and his wife Bonnie are here leading us and uh, we're so grateful for them. And we want you to uh, come and enjoy a time of fellowship together. Uh, and we're going to pray now for that meal, and uh, uh, why don't you all stand up, and we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll pray for the uh, refreshments today. God, we just are so in awe of you, and how you've given us a pastor with the heart that he has, and his wife, that um, we look up to and, and follow them because they are following you and your son, Jesus Christ, and what you've done in our lives. Father, today as we gather in fellowship, we just want to honor them and thank them for their leadership here. And as we partake in the food today, uh, we thank you for all that has prepared it. For those that have worked hard on this, we just thank you and praise you for this. And uh, we want to pray that you'll bless this food to our bodies this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 